You know, I was working on as commissioner, recognizing that, and I'm commissioner of agriculture, that farmers are the number one suicide rate in the country. Whoa. And so we went through, how do we fix that? And recognizing that so many in the farming community is they don't have access to communities like this, don't have access to health counselors. And so we tried to create a telehealth app. And the recognition that that same thing happens with our kids, that sometimes there's still a stigma to go and ask for help, to go into that counselor's office and know that it is okay and to come up with different opportunities and different access points like creating, everybody's got those things attached to their hands and to have a telehealth mental health app where our youth can go right on and have access to somebody 24 hours a day. Sometimes you don't wanna to talk to your parents. Um, there's also an amazing program that started here in Miami-Dade County that supports our kids, that it's in the actual schools, it's peer counseling and they've gone around to all the Miami-Dade schools and I don't know if you're part of it, you are, you are part of it. Um, and so I have been, I had an opportunity to, to actually go and speak to them back when I was running in 2018, because it's empowering you all to be peers and to support each other and to know that it is okay to not be okay and, and that everybody goes through things. So as long as we keep talking about it, putting resources into our schools, making sure that we've got programs like that, that not just in Dade County, but across the entire state, um, is what's going to make the difference. And, and of course, knowing that you've got a support system around you, um, also seeing what happened in Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in 2018, and knowing that there was people there instantaneously to help them. But what happens every single day, especially in our black communities, that's why I wear my bullets for life every day, to remind me that gun violence happens every day in our communities. And we need to make sure that there's resources for grief, resources to, to talk to people, and, and to continue these conversations to elevate them. That's how we're gonna get through all of these things. And I am so, and I just wanna apologize to you all. We are creating a generation that has PTSD because of the mass shootings in our schools. That we are having this generation go through active shooting drills and are more scared of going into the classrooms than they are going home. And we've got to do a better job for our youth, for our future, and to make sure that you are more scared about a pop-up quiz than you are for a mass shooting that could potentially happen in our schools. So we will do better. That is my word and my promise to this generation that we will do better because we have to. Okay. Well, Vicki, thank you for the question. I, I think that Nikki's right. We have to have the appropriate resources to deal with this problem. And, you know, we're both running against the guy who's the governor now, Ron DeSantis. And we had a horrible experience six years ago in Orlando, Florida at the Pulse nightclub, where 49 angels lost their lives to a mass shooter. Well, the legislature actually came together and almost unanimously, Republicans and Democrats, and put funding into the state budget last year that would have provided that kind of emotional support to the families who had a loved one that they had lost. And believe it or not, our current governor line item vetoed that funding out. So how do we address this issue? How do we deal with it going forward? You need a governor with a heart. You need a governor that has compassion and that cares about everybody, no matter who they love, no matter what they look like, no matter where they came from or what language they speak. And right now we don't have that. So I don't know if any of you are 18 or any of you 18 yet. Well, I would encourage you to vote <laughs> and for the rest of you to pre-register to vote uh, because the leaders that we select will determine the kind of leadership that we get and you deserve better leadership. Thank you. If anybody uh, 16? Nobody, everybody is 19 and everybody else is under 16. But I will say that most of our high school students are, who are 16 and above are all registered to vote. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Second question. Hi, I'm Taylor Scatliff. I go, I'm a sophomore at Hamilton College and I'm on the pre-law track. Um, I'll direct this question towards Commissioner Freed. 
Um, as of 2002, over 20 law schools and at least three non-law schools offered critical race theory courses or classes. How, do you, how would you propose the public school curriculum reflect Florida's rich diversity? Teach it. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's fundamental. <laughs> you gotta teach it. And, and I'll, I'll tell you a story. So my, my niece just turned 13 uh, back in March and she, we asked her what she wanted to do for her birthday. And she says, I wanna go to Washington DC with Auntie Nikki. Uh, so we took her to Washington and had a tour of the White House and then we went to the Capitol. And there is, if you haven't been there yet, definitely need to make a point to go. And we walked in and there's a whole presentation, and I'm sure Charlie, you've seen it, and it shows how the Capitol, the history of the Capitol. And it shows how who built the Capitol it was built by slaves. And as I'm sitting there, and my niece and nephew are in the Palm Beach County um, public school system, and I'm sitting there going, oh my God, are they gonna be taught this? And there was like this gut punch that that may no longer be taught in our schools. And I've been talking to so many of our educators who are right now going through this new Department of Education um, curriculum that literally is telling our teachers that the only thing that they can say about slavery is that this was a continuation of Great Britain and that the founding fathers never intended it to go on, period. That is atrocious. We've got to be teaching history. And, and somebody, again, I was talking about earlier that I come from the Jewish faith. And so at a very young age, we are taught about the Holocaust. And we're taught about the atrocities of six million Jews being murdered and six million others. And if we don't teach things like this, then it's going to repeat itself. And we're seeing the rise of anti-Semitism, the rise of racism in our state and across the country. And the only way to overcome hatred is through education and to get over the ignorance. And so it is something that is absolutely important that we have a new commissioner of education, a new board of education that is focusing on teaching the history of not only our state, but our nation. And no matter how difficult that conversation is, it is part of who we are as Americans and we've got to talk about it, we've got to learn from it, and we've got to make sure that we don't repeat the past of here in America. Taylor, that's a very important question. And I think what's crucial to handling it correctly is teach facts. We have to teach the truth. And if it's painful, it's painful. And if it's glorious, it's glorious. But we can't, you know, ignore facts in our history. And Nikki's right because, you know, there's an expression that those who don't learn history may be condemned to repeat it. And largely that talks about things like the Holocaust, but it applies to slavery as well. And to put this false notion about, you know, there's not been slavery in the U.S., you can't even discuss it, is shocking. That's the head in the sand approach, and it's wrong, it's false, and it's dishonest. And so it's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. I am going to have to go to North Lauderdale now, but I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. And thank you again, Pastor, for your kindness and your grace. Thank you. Uh, Congressman has another commitment, so we're going to uh, allow him to go. Give him a hand as he leaves. Thank you so much for stopping by today. And we'll continue our conversation with uh, Commissioner Freed, and we'll let you have the mic. I mean, yeah. Okay, good. So um, who's up next? Who's that third question? Need him? Okay. All right, Commissioner Reed, my question is for you is, if elected, what are your proposals to the federal government about the gas prices and how you would reduce them? Yes, and thank you for that question. So we start to start off here locally. Um, right now, gas prices in the state of Florida are higher than in other parts across the country. And for the last two and a half months, I have actually pleaded with this current governor to do a state of emergency when it comes to gas. And what that would have done is allow me in the Department of Agriculture to waive a statute that would have allowed our retailers to go below market price. But unfortunately, this governor is more focused on blaming Washington, D.C. than actually solving the problems here in the state of Florida. 
Because what would have happened is, is that if those retailers can go below market price, not only does it help the consumers, and I know none of you are, besides you are able to drive yet, but your parents, is not only help the consumer at the gas pump today, but it would have also been able to help all of the supply chain um, lower their prices, including, as Commissioner of Agriculture, our food prices. Because if you're able to get those prices down from the input, then you have the opportunity to also reduce the cost of food. So it would have been a double win for our state. And unfortunately, this governor has also only said, we're gonna have a tax-free holiday on gas in October. Does everybody know what happens in November? A little bit of an election. So he doesn't care about what is happening here in our state. And so we have been not only trying to focus on gas prices here in the state, but also when I first got in, when President Biden first got there, we submitted for the Department of Agriculture a 42-page plan to Washington, D.C. of things to work together on, including alternative uh, energy, ways to get us off of the necessity of using some of these oils, and making sure that we also make sure that our domestic supply chain is strong, that we're not having to rely on international gas. Because again, that puts us as a country um, in the hands of others. And we gotta make sure that we are secure here in our state, secure here in our country, and this is all hands on deck. Um, the prices are going to go down just by the mere fact of supply and demand and as things move forward. Um, but we have been very active in trying to get the gas prices down here in Florida. Unfortunately, we have a governor who is more focused on running for president of the United States than focusing on the issues of the day. All right, all right, all right. Awesome, thank you for the question. Hi, my name is Caleb Duport, and I have a question about the Supreme Court. Tell her, tell her where you attend school. Um, I attend school at Miami Lakes Educational Center. I am currently going to the ninth grade in the magnet program for IT. Awesome. Oh. Um, so my question is... Our future Elon Musk. <laughs> So my question is, how do you feel about the Supreme Court ruling of Roe versus Wade? And if elected, what would you refer to the government? Yep. It was a really hard day and very sad day for America. Um, first with the leak of the opinion and then as the actual opinion came out. And as somebody who's an attorney who practices law, um, October will be too long. Um, I'm going to age myself. It's been almost 20 years since I started practicing law, so 19 years. And studied what enumerated rights are and the right to privacy that is not in the Constitution. But our Supreme Court, for over 50 plus years, has given that right to privacy, not only on abortion rights, but everything that happens inside of the bedroom, everything that happens on interracial marriage, um, to contraceptives. Uh, to even access for, for LGBTQ families. And so what the Supreme Court did with five justices is undermined every aspect that so many people fought for, were jailed for, and some murdered for, including our civil rights movement, is all in these enumerated rights. And, and so not only am I angry, I am mad, but most importantly, I am invigorated to fight harder than I've ever fought before for democracy and for our country. And so as our next governor, the first female governor of our state, be the first time in 28 years that we will have a governor who is going to fight for that right to privacy. Now we do have a right to privacy inside of the Florida Constitution. However, with the 15 week abortion ban that was just passed by this Republican legislature and signed by this governor, that case is now going to go to this Florida Supreme Court. And not that I'm a betting woman, but if I was, my bet is that they're going to overturn the right to privacy for abortion rights, which means that we have to work harder here. And that means one, putting forth an executive order from my office on day one, making sure that we are protecting a woman's right to choose. And because we also know this too, and this is a very hard fact, that this is not going to stop abortions it is gonna stop safe abortions. And what it also is going to do, a hard fact, is it hurts our communities of color disproportionately. 
And so we know that there's gonna be so many women. We're gonna have to make that tough decision. And some of them are gonna find unsafe measures in order to move forward. So having a governor who's willing on day one to have an executive order that says no money is going to be utilized from the executive branch to prosecute any doctor or any woman who goes through this procedure. Two, to make sure that I'm putting the full weight of the governor's office behind a constitutional amendment to expand that right to privacy, to make sure that it includes a woman's right to choose. And third, we have to work with the legislature to revamp these laws, to go back to what we wanted and what we had. 67% of our state did not want the 15-week abortion ban, did not want the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And, and look, this is also a separation of church and state, that every religion talks about this differently. And it is important that we respect people's rights and their rights to believe religiously how they want to proceed in this issue. And that was taken away by the Supreme Court. So I am a fierce fighter, and this is an issue that I talk about every day, I've rallied for. Um, there was talking about your 13. There was a 13-year-old girl that was arrested and detained this past week in Polk County for going out and protesting her rights. And she used a bullhorn and they arrested her on a noise violation. Wow. And I went out and I protested with her this past Thursday to say that no one is going to silence us. No one is going to suppress our rights and certainly not our rights to protest and freedom of speech. And you, you guys ask, ask some questions that are very relevant to the community and to the nation. So that question about abortion is always one that kind of intersects with how people believe and understand these whole issues around life. But I'll share a story with you. Uh, my great grandmother had, I think, six kids and one, she had one girl. And so uh, her name was Fanny. She was born in 1918. And so in 1936, she enrolled in college. So she's the first person in my family that I'm aware of having enrolled in college and university. So she enrolled in college and university in uh, 1936. But she died in 1938. And she died as the result of a botched abortion, a bad abortion. So that's, that's how she died. So we go to our cemetery, we have a family cemetery in North Carolina, it says, you know, Fanny Barnhill, 1918 to 19, 1938. And the, the real truth about it is um, she didn't have access um, to a safe procedure that may have saved her life. So, um, so that's a part of what we're considering here when we talk about what's, what's going to happen as a result of this um, rule being, um, being made illegal, being over, overturned. So, uh, yeah, I want you all to think about that deeply. And there are other sides to it also, but I want to share that. Next question. Hi, my name is Riley Kirsten, and I'm a sophomore at Everglades High School. And my question for you is, what will you propose if elected to make housing more affordable for first-time homeowners? Thank you for that question, because that too is uh, pressing every single day in our state. Um, and the state of Florida has become unaffordable. He, you know, in Broward County, only 8% of residents of Broward County can afford to purchase a home. Wow. So let me kind of go through how we got here. How we got here is kind of a couple of things. One is that for the last 25 years, we have been gutting what is called the, the Sadowski Fund, the Affordable Trust Fund, and the tune of about $2.4 billion. That is money that was supposed to be set aside to building affordable homes. And so we haven't had that money here in the state of Florida that means less homes have been being built, which means there's less supply. And then in the last couple of years, we've had um, governors who have been trying to bring people into our state. And so they've come in with a lot of money and they're buying at the high end of the market. And then they're squeezing down the rest of the market, which means that there's not enough supply and people are getting taken out of the marketplace and they can't afford it. And so we have now two double whammies happening. One we have rent being increased significantly all across our state. Not just the inflation, which is 11.4, which is higher here in Florida than across the country, 
But what's happening is you're seeing, you're talking about predatory aspects. You've got predatory landlords who are taking advantage of individuals. And so you're seeing 30, 40, 50, 60% rent increases all across our state. That is not inflation, that is greed. And so as governor, day one, outside of my, I've got two executive orders, one dealing with women's rights and two dealing with affordability and the housing crisis and declaring a housing emergency because that's what it is. It is an emergency. If you can't afford and can't put a roof over your head, part of that American dream of home ownership and being able to have security for your family, then who are we as Americans? And so one, we have a state of emergency. That gives me the opportunity to then allow our state attorneys and our attorney general to go after these landlords who are doing this predatory. Two, I also have the resources. We have almost $22 billion now that is in our reserves in the state of Florida. The governor wants to say what a great economy this is, but he forgot something very important. How much money came down from the federal government in the last couple years that have allowed that surplus yeah. to happen? and allow him to do tax cuts on the big corporations because he's getting all of this money coming down from the Biden administration. So we then release some of those money instantaneously to be able to build more affordable homes and making sure that we're building up and not out because we're running out of land and making sure that we're building close to mass transit because a lot of people can't afford cars, the insurance on it, gas these days. So making sure that we're building the homes and doing it strategically. We used to have a statewide committee that actually brought in leaders from all across the state, local governments, builders, uh, environmentalists, in figuring out how to build out the state of Florida instead of this hodgepodge approach that is not working for most of the people. And then also we need to have um, opportunities to work with our local governments to figure out exactly where to be building these affordable homes, make sure that they're there to increase the marketplace. Then I've also proposed the largest tax cut in Florida's history, to go from $50,000 of homestead exemption to $100,000. That will be the largest tax cut in history. And knowing that that's gonna potentially hurt our local governments, there is so much money at the state level. It's called priorities. And making sure that our local governments don't hurt because it's helping the people out on the local level. Um, but it is something that is a concerted effort. And unfortunately, we have people in Tallahassee right now that affordable housing doesn't even come out of their mouth. And that is not the right approach. We need to be putting together task forces. There's lots of creative opportunities out here, but if you don't have leadership in Tallahassee who focuses on these issues, then you won't have results. That's a great question, Riley. You're giving me my cell phone back. You hacked it, didn't you? <laughs> okay, well, um, I want to thank the commissioner for sharing this time. You guys asked some really great questions. I, I do want to say, you clarified a question. We were having a conversation about these questions um, earlier this week. And we were talking about the housing issue, and I made a statement. I said, well, I don't know how much, what they're going to be able to do for a, uh, a, a landlord, you know, what they're going to say to a landlord. But you addressed that in terms of some of the predatory practices that happen. So we're glad, glad to hear that. So everybody got a chance to ask a question, but do you have anything non-political that, or, or non-policy-wise that you want to ask the commission before she, before she goes? Um, um, my question is, what was your favorite subject in school? My favorite subject in school was government. Um, it was my, my both history and government, so American history and also government. It's when I actually, where I registered to vote was in my AP government and economics class. My, when I was a senior in high school, I was 17 years old. That's when I, yes, <laughs> the voice of God, <laughs> uh, where I registered to vote and power to find my passion for public service. Oh. Anybody else? Oh. Go ahead, Taylor. Um, if you weren't a politician, what would you be doing right now? Sleeping. Um, <laughs> They're not, not getting much sleep these days, right? <laughs> so I was practicing law. So I graduated from the University of Florida with my undergrad, a master's degree in political campaigning. So I get to finally use that degree uh, and law and law. And so after graduating from law school, I first moved up to Jacksonville, uh, where I was doing corporate litigation, and I hated every single moment of that. And that's when I moved back to Gainesville and I was the public defender's office for three and a half years and then eventually moved back to South Florida and practiced all types of law. 
Um, so I know that you're pre-law. Um, and so I think the biggest advice that I'm gonna give to you is this. There are so many opportunities with a law degree that you don't have to go into the big firms, that you can find a passion project. The most important aspect of practicing law is find where your heart and passion is. Um, because there's a lot of things, um, I think, what is that quote? That if you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. Um, so to always find your passion. Um, and I've always wanted to give back into public service. You heard my speech earlier today that I grew up down here. I was volunteering at, at Camilla's house on the weekends. I was doing soup kitchens. I was doing Habitat. Um, but my passion has always been to give back, which is why I found going to the public defender's office, fighting for homeowners during the foreclosure crisis. Uh, when I did government consulting, I was fighting for foster care kids, for the Broward School Board, with expansion of access for medical marijuana patients. But it was always about giving back. Um, and now I'm in elected office to, to do just the same thing, just on a little bigger of a scale. Okay, all right. Anyone else before we, okay, Ray Riley. Were there any organizations that you were in growing up, sorry, <clears throat> that have assisted you into where you are right now? Lots of them. Uh, so growing up, I was in a Jewish youth organization that I spent most of my days working in and that gave me a lot of leadership skills it gave me a lot of opportunities to explore things. And actually, um, one of the other things I did in my youth group, we created what was called Impact Theater um, back in my junior and senior year of high school. And it was a traveling group. And there was probably about 15 of us, and we created these own little vignettes. And we went around to churches, we went around to organizing events, and it was talking about the issues of that day, um, going into the hard conversations about sexual harassment in the workforce, interracial relationships, Again, this is a long time ago. Um, and, and so that gave me also an opening of, of new opportunities. And then throughout my entire career, um, I was involved with the Young Lawyers Board of Governors from the Florida Bar, uh, which also gave me new opportunities. I've been very involved in the Florida Bar. Uh, so there's been a lot of, of great opportunities and organizations that I have been involved in. And again, it goes back to that passion. You know, find you know, what inspires you. Find the people to surround yourself with that lift you up. And, and for, for our, our, our girls and our women, um, I also recognize very, very intuitively that I stand on the shoulders of so many women that came before me. And now it's my job to bring the women behind me with me. And I was the first female student body president at the University of Florida in almost two decades. And since my time there, um, now we've had five. And so knowing that I broke a tremendous, huge glass ceiling and was able to open up people's eyes um, to what female leadership looks like. And so I take that very seriously to inspire the next generation of women um, that anything is possible. Sometimes we have to work a little bit harder to get where we wanna go, but it's worth it. And as long as you follow your goals and your dreams, anything is possible. All right, all right, all right, all right. Anyone else before we close? Oh, okay, yes, sir. All right, my question is, what do you mostly spend doing on your free time? Well, today I don't have any free time. <laughs> um, but I, I love traveling. Um, I have a younger sister and a niece and a nephew who I absolutely adore that I love spending time with them. I've got a 92-year-old grandmother who wow. lives here, and well, she lives in, in Palm Beach County now with my mom and my dad, um, spending time with family, but I'm also a gym rat. Uh, so if I had the opportunity every single day to spend hours at the gym, it clears your head, it gets out energy, makes you feel good, keeps you healthy. Uh, so if I wasn't with family and traveling, uh, the gym calls my name every single day. Okay, all right, awesome. All right, anything else? Oh, okay, Vicki. <laughs> um, have you ever been like, in a group type of person? Like, if you have, like, what sport? Would you so I tried a lot growing up. I did everything from dance to softball to you name it. And at kind of about age of 12, my family said, we're done with this. This is not going well for you. And that's when I got more into, I did speech and debate in high school. Um, so if you are not involved in speech and debate programs, you are. Awesome, awesome, awesome training grounds. Uh, it gives you confidence and an ability to know how to, how to speak, how to talk, how to interact, how to present yourself. Uh, but uh, no, sports was definitely not my thing to do. 
Um, but now that I'm at a do the gym, that's kind of where I, where I get that, that exercise. But my sister, though, played basketball, and I rooted her on with a zeal. <laughs> Vicki, you play sports? Yes. What do you play? I play basketball. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay, let's give these students a hand. <laughs> Commissioner, any, any final words? Final words are this. <clears throat> keep dreaming. Keep dreaming. Keep showing up. Keep fighting for what you believe in. Keep coming to church. Uh, keep staying involved in your communities. Um, and make sure you stay engaged um, because you truly are the future of our state and our country. Your generation is going to change the world. Um, I am inspired every single day by you know, the, the kids from Parkland that started a true movement. Um, there is a climate, um, kids for climate change that across the country are making huge fundamental change when it comes to our climate and our environment. Your generation keeps us in check. And so keep speaking up, keep staying engaged, make sure that your, your classmates are involved um, because if you sit at home, you can't make a difference. So keep showing up, keep following your dreams and anything is possible. So thank you for, for these questions today. Okay, okay, so we're going to dismiss and take a picture, but Commissioner Freed, thank you so much. We, we feel honored and blessed to have Florida's Commissioner of Agriculture right here on our campus, and so we don't take that for granted, knowing how busy also you are with the campaign. Thank you for agreeing to speak and spend some time with these students. I hope you all appreciate it and had a good time with, with, with us. Also, we, we want to wish you the best. Uh, of course, uh, Governor, I mean, uh, former Governor Chris, we wish both of you the best, but you're here, and one of the things we want to do um, that I've made a commitment to doing before you leave this, I want to um, have a prayer for you, because um, uh, it's, it's a very grueling and intense and time-consuming, all-exacting process uh, that you're engaging, and so we just want to pray for your health and your safety and that, um, that you get everything out of this experience that is, it is designed um, that's designed for. So uh, let's, just, let's just bow our heads. God, we thank you um, for this day. We thank you for uh, Commissioner Freed, for her presence here, for her time with these students, for hearing their questions and their heart, and for just engaging in uh, a time to chat about what's happening in Florida and in this world. But we ask you to bless her as she travels around this state and communicates her message and we pray for her health and for her safety, for clarity of thought as she presents multiple times each day. We pray for those other obligations that are important in her life, her family, her mom and dad, and her sister and niece and nephew. We just ask that you'd watch over all of them and God, um, that you would uh, get everything out of her life that you've designed her for. We also pray for Charlie Chris and all that he is doing and uh, we just pray that you be pleased with all of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.